Hello everyone, I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. A lot of data was presented at ASCO 2023, but today we will focus on three clinically relevant studies in lung cancer that should be on your radar as a practicing medical oncologist. To start, we'll discuss a DORA trial in adjuvant settings and then Keynote 789, looking at what to do when patients progress on anti-EGFR drugs. Then we'll finish by discussing Keynote 671, where we'll dive into the role of immunotherapy and peri-op settings for non-small cell lung cancer. To walk us through these critical studies, we're joined by none other than Dr. Charu Agarwal from UPenn. Dr. Agarwal, welcome. Thank you for having me. This is a great time to discuss these so many advances at ASCO. Dr. Agarwal, thank you so much for joining us. Let us kick off with the first study, a DORA trial, which was presented at the plenary session. Osimertinib was approved in adjuvant non-small cell lung cancer space in EGFR mutated patients, and this was based on disease-free survival. Now this ASCO 2023, overall survival uh, updates were presented. Before we jump on into the overall survival benefit, can you please walk us through the study design? As that sets the stage, who should get this therapy and importance of NGS testing for our patient population? Absolutely. So this study was presented uh, for the first time um, at the virtual annual ASCO meeting in 2020. Uh, that was the first time we had seen the disease-free survival update. So in summary, this is a study in the adjuvant setting, as you pointed out, patients with stage 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer with activating mutations in EGFR were included. This is strictly a trial for exon 19 deletions and those with L858R mutations. Patients had to have good performance status, more than 18 years of age, and had to have complete resection and a brain uh, absence of brain metastases. Um, had to be an important inclusion criteria. Patients then received osimertinib uh, or placebo once daily for a total of three years. Patients could get on this uh, drug in the absence of adjuvant chemotherapy, but ad adjuvant chemotherapy um, was allowed. So the sequence in that situation would be surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy followed by either osimertinib or placebo. And the primary endpoint for this clinical trial was disease-free survival amongst patients with stage two to three A lung cancer. And DFS in overall population that is including one Bs was a secondary endpoint and overall survival was also a secondary endpoint. Thank you, Dr. Ergerwal. I think that it is so important to continue to reiterate, and we've done this now and even in our past uh, lung cancer discussions, NGS testing is so critical, not only in metastatic space, we'll dive into the OS data here, but also so important in early non-small cell lung cancer patients as well. Absolutely. And we are making an effort to try and um, do or perform molecular testing on all patients with a diagnosis of non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, irrespective of stage, just because of these important implications in the perioperative space. So moving along, what did the study exactly show? Yeah, so I think we already knew that there was a disease-free survival benefit based, in based on the results in 2020. We had an approval already, but I think the biggest question in everyone's mind was what is the overall survival benefit? And uh, many, many providers were reluctant to adopt uh, adjuvant osimertinib based on just a DFS benefit, even though that was the primary endpoint. What we found uh, during this presentation of Adora was that there was a significant improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.49. I think five-year uh, overall survival rates of about 88% in patients uh, that were all comers as well as 85% in the intent to treat population, this, the two, two to three A's, um, is very encouraging. The hazard ratio was 0.49 even if the stage 1Bs were included. Right, this opens up so many more doors for other targeted therapies in this arena, though there are trials ongoing, but this is exciting time for management space, especially when this is the first time we are seeing a targeted therapy showing overall survival benefit. Prior to this, we only had chemotherapy showing that. Exactly. And, you know, this is uh, this should be this trial should be celebrated for being a first in this space exactly for that reason. 
Um, exactly, exciting times. But when we're talking about chemotherapy, I know this study was not designed to look to see who can skip chemotherapy. But Dr. Agarwal, would you consider skipping chemotherapy in perhaps stage 1B patients? So that's a great question. So about two thirds of the patients on this trial actually did not receive chemotherapy and went on to receive either osimertinib or placebo. But when we look at stage specific receipt of chemotherapy, most of the higher stage patients, especially those with stage 3A, majority of them received chemotherapy, about 80 percent. Um, I think for stage 2 to 3A or patients with no nodal involvement, I would still recommend chemotherapy. I think stage 1Bs, uh, again, you know, I think there has been a change in the staging criteria for when the study was designed. It was AJCC7 and now we have AJCC8. I would say for the AJCC8, stage 1Bs, potentially we could avoid chemotherapy, but still strongly consider a discussion of adjuvant osimertinib if in the right context. Absolutely. Thank you for going over that. While on the topic of EGFR mutated patients, treatment after first line targeted agents is still a big unmet need. And we've often questioned, is there any role of immunotherapy? This takes us into our next study, Keynote 789. Dr. Agarwal, can you discuss the study design here? Yeah, and I think this is a really good selection from ASCO just because I think this is a very important clinical question. In the metastatic space, when we have an activating EGFR mutation, we use osimertinib. We know that the median overall survival is over three years, but we know that the median PFS is somewhere about 18 to 19 months. Um, and really what this question was asking was chemoimmunotherapy versus chemotherapy uh, following um, osimertinib. Uh, and resistance, uh, sorry, following osimertinib or progression on osimertinib. So the study was designed for the stage four non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. Again, those two activating mutations after first or second generation EGFR TKI without T790M or after first or second generation EGFI with a T790M, but those patients had to have osimertinib. And then these patients were randomized to receive either carbo or cis and combination pemetrexid with or without uh, pembrolizumab uh, in com for four cycles followed by PEM pembro maintenance or PEM placebo maintenance. And there were 492 patients that were randomized with a primary endpoint of PFS and a key secondary endpoint of overall response rate and duration of response. It's important to note that overall survival was actually one of the primary endpoints. Now moving along with the study results, what did this study show exactly? So we found no significant benefit um, of basically of addition of pembrolizumab. I think that's the bottom line here. So for patients with EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer, there doesn't seem to be any iota of evidence to support a triplet regimen, um, especially in this situation. As you can see, the green lines are the ones with pembrolizumab and chemotherapy, median PFS coming in at five and a half, five point six 5.6 months, and overall survival 15.9 months, maybe numerically a little bit higher, but hazard ratio is 0 0.8 and 0 0.84, and the p-values are not significant. Right, so overall what we saw was, in fact, a negative study though there's quite a bit to learn despite that, that we have been utilizing as prime power 150, though this patient population was small, but EGFR mutated po patient population still had some benefit when atezole was combined with chemo and bevacizumab. So how would you interpret that in comparison to this? Would we say that immunotherapy essentially have no role or these two immunotherapeutic agents are just different? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I think that's um, unclear. When the Empower 150 results came out, you know, if you looked at the ABCP arm versus the one without bevacizumab, the thought was uh, perhaps the benefit is being driven by the anti-VEGF agent. However, th those were all subset exploratory analyses and weren't powered enough to really demonstrate that difference. I do think that there is benefit of VEGF inhibition in the setting of EGFR uh, TKI resistant uh, management of patients. However, I think at this point, what we can conclude is that there doesn't seem to be benefit with immunotherapy and chemotherapy alone. I have a lot of colleagues and many people who still want 
want to deliver the quadruplet approach um, in the situation and for a select group of patients that may be still an appropriate choice. But I think for by and large, for the most patients, we can say that potentially continuation of osimertinib with chemotherapy may be a better approach and has been my practice to also provide that blood-brain bar barrier penetration with osimertinib and sort of graft on the benefit of chemotherapy on top of that. And again, this is a moving target. As you've said, continuing osimertinib with chemotherapy. We're also awaiting data of first-line osimertinib with chemotherapy. So this perhaps conversation will be very different once we have that data. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much for covering that, Dr. Agarwal. Now let us go back into the resectable space of non-small cell lung cancer, but again, sticking to the theme of immunotherapy. Here, based on Checkmate 816, neoadjuvant chemo plus nivolumab got approved. However, more recently, we've seen the data of perioperative approach with dorvalumab, toripalumab, and now pembrolizumab. Can you please walk us through this study design for our last study, that is Keynote 671? Yeah, so again, I think um, a lot happening in the perioperative space. Keynote 671 it was a large randomized phase three trial evaluating the use of both neoadjuvant use of pembrolizumab in combination with chemotherapy, as well as adjuvant use of immunotherapy with pembrolizumab. Patients with stage two to three A, slightly dis uh, three B, sorry, slightly distinct from the Checkmate 816 population, according to AJCC version eight who had not had received any prior therapy and were candidates for surgery with a good performance status were randomized to chemoimmunotherapy for four cycles versus chemotherapy alone for four cycles. I will stop here and note that chemotherapy was only mandated to be cisplatin specific. So cisgem for squames and cispem for non-squames for up to four cycles, followed by surgery in each arm. And then the patients who were on the pembrolizumab arm could receive pembrolizumab for up to 13 cycles or a year of therapy. Uh, patients receive placebo on the placebo arm every three uh, weeks for 13 cycles. Dual primary endpoints of EFS and OS and key secondary endpoints were pathologic complete response, uh, which was one of the key uh, secondary endpoint. Dr. Agarwal, thank you so much for bringing the chemo selection because, again, that was different than what we saw with Checkmate 816 as carboplatin was allowed in those patients. Exactly. And then what did the study show? Because from what we can see, it's very similar to what we've seen with other immunotherapy combination in the space. Exactly. And, you know, we have both approval for just neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy. We have approval for just adjuvant immunotherapy. And these trials, IG and NeoTorch and Keynote 671, are basically just combining all of the above approaches. And what we are seeing is uh, two distinct things. One is that event-free survival is improved uh, with the combination chemoimmunotherapy. I think we would have been surprised if it wasn't improved. So this is um, not something that really surprises us. We expect EFS to be better. Here again, we see a hazard ratio of 0.58. Um, what this study provides uh, is a early look at overall survival uh, for the combination arm, that is neoadjuvant as well as adjuvant pembrolizumab. We are seeing a hazard ratio of 0.73. Again, this is um, slightly immature data. The overall follow-up on this data is about 25.2 months, um, longer than the Aegean trial, uh, but we are seeing hints of efficacy. And then you potentially have this on another slide, but the second thing that we are noticing is that the path CR rate is about 18%, similar to what we are seeing on Aegean. I think the path CR rates are landing at about 17 to 18% with these trials. Now, having such similar data that we have at this point in time, if all three regimens, as per Keynote 671, Agent and Neotorch, do get approved, do you, would you favor one regimen or the other? That's such a good question, and I don't know if I can really differentiate based on the data. They're all looking very similar. I think this is the same conversation we had when all of the metastatic non-small cell lung cancer trials were reading out um, in the second line space first, where Nevo and Pembro and Atezo, they looked all the same. And then the same conversation in the first line setting where uh, basically uh, these drugs look the same. So I think uh, 
depends on which approvals come first. Um, I think that will dictate what people use. In my in my observation, I think many people are already, many physicians are already using a combination of new adjuvant and adjuvant immunotherapy based on the patient uh, situation. But curious to hear what, what you think and how this will this will change our practice. Yeah, at least as a general medical oncologist, I think we are going to be stuck with cross-trial comparisons. We still don't know how much adjuvant immunotherapy in each of these studies is really adding, uh, because coming back to Checkmate 816, is just that approach good enough? Because if we're relying on PATCR or event-free survival, those are very comparable. So I think that this just ends up being a nuanced talk with the patient in front of you saying, this is all based off EFS. We don't have OS. We have to wait for long-term data. But again, I don't know how much adjuvant immunotherapy is adding in these patients. And I think what's more important from this exciting space is to get everyone on board, including our surgeon colleagues, and making sure that this is a multidisciplinary approach. Dr. Agarwal, thank you so much for taking the time to go over these practice-informing and reinforcing studies from ASCO 2023 in lung cancer space with us today. For our listeners, stay tuned for a quick summary. Thank you very much for having me. This was great. Post ASCO, we have covered three clinically relevant studies in lung cancer with Dr. Charu Agarwal. We started with a DORA trial and then followed by Keynote 789 and Keynote 671. As mentioned during our discussion, osimertinib was approved in adjuvant settings back in 2020 based of disease-free survival. Now we have overall survival data. It is imperative to check for these actionable mutations, not only in metastatic settings, but also in early stage. As a patient, knowing you have lung cancer is just not good enough. We need to inform you on what type of lung cancer, and if you have any actionable mutation that we can attack is going to be so critical. Moving along from a DORA trial, we covered Keynote 789 with pembrolizumab combined with chemo in second-line metastatic setting. Current standard of care for patients with EGFR mutation in metastatic setting is administering targeted therapy with TKI, followed by chemotherapy in second-line setting. This study addressed if addition of pembrolizumab would add any benefit, which is not the case here. As a result, this study was in fact a negative trial. Also, we need to appreciate that not all EGFR or actionable mutations are the same. Then lastly, we covered Keynote 671, looking at the role of perioperative immunotherapy and neoadjuvant chemotherapy in resectable non-small cell lung cancer. These patients had a higher pathological response and a multidisciplinary discussion for these patients is going to be very important. That is what we have for you in lung cancer from ASCO 2023. We appreciate you joining us. Tune back in again for more updates.